can we get the physics simulation done well enough to where we can start estimating like what are the possible earth-like things that could be generated yeah i think we can i think we're learning how to do that now um so you know one part is like trying to just figure out how to how planets form themselves and doing the simulations like that that cascade from uh dust grains up to planetary embryos that's hard to simulate because it's both, you got to do both the gas and you got to do the dust and the dust colliding and all that physics. Um, once you get up to a planet sized body, then, you know, you kind of have to switch over to almost like a different kind of simulation there. Often what you're doing is you're doing, you know, sort of, you're assuming the planet is this sort of spherical ball. And then you're doing what, you know, like a one D a radial calculation. And you're just asking like, all right, how is this thing going to, what is the structure of it going to be? Like, am I going to have a solid iron core or am I going to get a solid iron core with that liquid iron core out around it like we have on, on Earth? And then you get, you know, a silicate, kind of a rocky mantle and then a crust. All of those details, those are kind of beyond being able to do full 3D simulations from ab initio, from scratch. We're not there yet. Uh, how important are those details, like the crust and the atmosphere, do you think? Hugely important. So I I'm part of a collaboration at the University of Rochester where we're using uh, the giant laser. It's literally, this is yeah. called the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. We got a huge grant from the NSF to use that laser to like slam tiny pieces of silica to understand what the conditions are like at, you know, the center of the earth, or even more importantly, the center of super earths, like the most common, this is what's wild. The most common kind of planet in the universe we don't have in our solar system, which is amazing, right? So the, uh, we've been able to study enough or observe enough planets now to get a census. You know, we pretty, you know, we kind of have an idea yeah. of what who's average, who's weird. Um, and our solar system's weird because the average planet has a mass between somewhere between a few times the mass of the earth to maybe, you know, 10 times the mass of the earth. And that's exactly where there are no planets in our solar system. So, um, the smaller ones of those we call super earths, the larger ones we call sub Neptunes. And they're anybody's guess. Like, we don't really know what happens to material when you're squeezed to those pressures, which is like millions, tens of millions of times the, the pressure on the surface of the earth. So those details really will matter of what's going on in there, because that will determine whether or not you have, say, for example, plate tectonics. We think plate tectonics may have been really important for life on earth, for the evolution of complex life on earth. So it turns out and this is sort of the next generation where we're going with the, the understanding the evolution of planets and life. It turns out that you actually have to think hard about the planetary context for life. You can't just be like, oh, there's a warm pond, you know, and then some interesting, you know, chemistry happens in the warm pond. You actually have to think about the planet as a whole and what it's gone through in order to really understand whether a planet is a good place for life or not. Why do you think plate tectonics might be uh, useful for the formation of complex life? There's a bunch of different things. One is that, you know, the Earth went through a couple of phases of being a snowball planet. Like, we, you know, we went into a period of glaciation mm -hmm. where the, pretty much the entire planet was under ice. The, the oceans were frozen. Um, you know, early on in Earth's history, there was no, there was barely any land. We were actually a water world, you know, with just a couple of um, Australia-sized cratons, they called them, protocontinents. So those, uh, we went through these snowball earth phases. And if it wasn't for the fact that we had kind of an active plate tectonics, which had a lot of volcanism on it, um, we could have been locked in that forever. Like once you get into a snowball state, a planet can be trapped there forever, which is, you know, maybe you already had life form, but then because it's so cold, you may never get anything more than just microbes. Right. So what plate tectonics does is it, because it fosters more, um, uh, volcanism is that you're going to get carbon dioxide pumped into the atmosphere, which warms the planet up and gets you out of the, uh, the, uh, snowball earth phase. But even more, there's even more really important things. I just finished a paper where we were looking at something called the hard steps model, which is this model that's been out there for a long time that purports to say, intelligent life in the universe will be really rare. And it made all these assumptions about the Earth's history, particularly the history of life and the history of the planet or have nothing to do with each other. And it turns out, as I was doing the reading for this, that uh, Earth probably early on had a, had a more mild form of plate tectonics. And then somewhere about a billion years ago, it ramped up. And that ramping up changed everything on the planet. Because here's a funny thing. The Earth used to be flat. 
know what I mean by that, right? So all the flat earthers out there can get excited for one second. Clip it. <laughs> what, I meant by, <laughs> what I mean by that is that there really weren't many mountain ranges, right? The beginning of, I think the term is orogenesis, mountain building, the true Himalayan style giant mountains didn't happen until this more robust form of plate tectonics where the plates are really being driven around the planet. And that is when you get the crusts hitting each other and they start pushing you know, into these Himalayan style mountains, the weathering of that, the erosion of that puts huge amounts of nutrients, you know, things that microbes want to use, uh, into the oceans. And then the, what we call the net primary productivity, the, you know, the photo, the, the, the bottom of the food chain, how much sugars they're producing, how much photosynthesis they're doing shot up by a factor of a, almost a thousand, right? So the the fact that you had plate tectonics supercharged evolution in some sense, you know, like we're not exactly sure how, how, how it happened, but it's clear that the amount of life, the amount of living activity that was happening really got a boost from the fact that suddenly there was plate, this new vigorous form of plate tectonics. So it's nice to have turmoil in terms of temperature, in terms of, uh, surface geometries, in terms of the chemistry of the planet turmoil. Yeah, that's actually really true because what happens is if you look at the history of life, that's a really, you know, it's an excellent point you're bringing up. If you look at the history of life on earth, we get, uh, you know, a biogenesis somewhere around at least 3.8 billion years ago. And that's the first microbes. They kind of take over enough that they really do. You get a biosphere, you get a biosphere that is actively changing the planet. But then you go through this period they call the boring billion, where like it's a billion years and it's just microbes. Nothing's happening. It's just microbes. I mean, they're, they're doing, the microbes are doing amazing things. They're inventing uh, um, fermentation. Thank you very much. For, <laughs> we appreciate that. Um, but it's not until sort of you get probably this, these continents slamming into each other. You really get the beginning of continents forming and driving changes that evolution has to respond to, that on a planetary scale – this turmoil, this chaos is creating new niches as well as closing other ones. And biology, evolution has to respond to that. And somewhere around there is when you get the Cambrian explosion is when suddenly every body plan, um, you know, e evolution goes on an orgy essentially. Uh, so yeah, it does look like the, that chaos or that turmoil was actually very helpful to evolution.